morning, everyone. So here we are starting out a new week. And I know last week we were kind of sticking with a, a Halloween theme. We were talking about some supernatural things, uh, that, that kind of, uh, that kind of what message, I guess, theme. Uh, but we were, we were kind of doing that. And uh, I think that we pretty much have wrapped that up because I don't know what else, where else to go with that. I mean, we could talk about like UFOs or something that definitely isn't um, mentioned in scripture. But, I, you know, I was like, you know, I think we covered everything here. So maybe we should start up a new study. And I'm particularly interested in 1 John. We have talked extensively about 1 John chapter 1. And of course, that's because we're, that's where we get the famous 1 John 1, 9 that gets turned into this uh, doctrine of repeated confession to get more forgiveness from God, where you become the high priest, you become your own advocate, you have to go before the Father, you have to secure your forgiveness, um, all that. We've all heard that. We've heard that to death. We've talked about it quite extensively. But, uh, you know, there's, there's five more chapters um, of, of this particular book. And I thought, I was like, you know, you know what let's let's go through um let's go through all of this and because there's there's so much here to unpack and it's just it's so awesome first john is basically the gospel of john um explained so some of the things that jesus says in the gospel of john some of the things that john records he picks up on it later and he starts talking about it later and oh also here's what this means and let me make this simpler uh, and john john is like that that's why i like his writing so much that's why i like his gospel so much uh, compared to matthew mark and luke uh, john is very simplistic it's all about jesus it's all about believe in jesus and that's how you're saved uh, john is hitting this over and over and over in his gospel and he even tells you that at the end he says and these things were written uh, jesus did many other things john says, uh, but these were written so that you might believe and by believing you might have life in his name. So he tells you the whole purpose of why he wrote um, and what his, where his heart was at. It was, he was really trying to get you that uh, vanilla Christianity, that, that um, undiluted believe in Jesus Christ. And that's how you're, that's how you're saved. Uh, Jesus is the son of God. That's the whole message of the gospel of John. And it really does stand out from the other three. The other three are more or less, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Um, here is um, all the prophecies Jesus fulfilled from the Old Testament. And that's that's helpful, too. We want that, too. Um, but again, we're not Jews. And, you know, the Old Testament scriptures weren't given to us, being Gentiles in the flesh. So so John is just a lot more geared uh, toward the, toward the um, formerly Gentile um, who's now become a child of God. It's a lot more geared uh, toward that audience. So like it a lot. Um, and let's go through it. Let's go through First uh, John. Let's go through First John, just a few chapters here. So starting at the beginning, uh, we're going to start at 1 John chapter 2, like I said, because we've covered one so much. Uh, he says in 1 John 2, uh, verse 1, he says, My children, I am writing, writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's a very, very interesting verse there. Um, he's telling you the purpose of what he's writing. Now, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you will not sin. These things means exactly what he just said in chapter 1. And what was he warning them against in chapter 1? He was warning them against teachings that claim a non-physical Jesus. That's why he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our eyes, which our hands have touched, which we have heard, this we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. Um, the life has appeared and we have seen this, we've testified to this. Um, that he's saying that because what's going on in the first century is something known as the Gnostic crisis. And this is just a historical event. Um, this can be looked up in Christian history books. Probably some secular ones record the Gnostic religion as well. But it was really prevalent in the, in, the, in the later part of the first century. It was called the Gnostic crisis. And essentially what you had happening is you had Christian teachers changing everything all of a sudden and saying that Jesus was what they called a spiritual phantasm. He was not physical. He had no physical body. Um, he could not have died on the cross. This was some kind of an illusion that he put on. Uh, he, he was a master of that, according to Gnosticism, because he did all kinds of things that um, they said, well, it's some kind of a spiritual illusion that Jesus is performing. Um, they said he was he was God, but kind of. He's like a, he's like a demigod, like lower case G. He was kind of God, um, but he was, it was different. It was a much different Jesus. Uh, and anyway, this belief in the non-physical Jesus is called Docetism. And um, it, this was a staple in Gnostic doctrines. Um, the other staple in Gnostic doctrines was a belief in something called the Demiurge. And the Demiurge, uh, Demi means God, and Urge, I'm guessing, means something very negative. <laughs> but uh, Demiurge was this 
being, which the Gnostics believed was Yahweh in the Old Testament. They called him the Demiurge. And they said that that God, whatever that was in the Old Testament, is not the same as the father of Jesus Christ because they're nothing alike. And the Gnostics really hung on that. And they said this, this God was all about wrath and everything like that. And this one over here is all about love. And we can't seem to harmonize these things. So they, they separated out the Old Testament scriptures. Um, that is actually, interestingly enough, what led to a desperate move on op um, opponents to Gnosticism. I'm not sure what you would just call them, maybe just Christians, kind of. But opponents to Gnosticism, because of the demiurge, because of the, the, disc the discarding of the Old Testament scriptures, that is actually um, what led the creation of the biblical canon, led the opponents of Gnosticism to the creation of the biblical canon because they wanted to get the Old Testament in there. Uh, so the Gnostics left their mark on, on Christianity. They may be all but gone now, but they certainly left their mark. And because of them, we can thank them for the bad doctrine coming from 1 John 1, 9, because that would have never been written if it wasn't for them. So we still feel their effects today. All that being said, when he says in chapter 2, verse 1, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, he's referencing everything he just said about these teachers. These things to you so that you do not sin. Don't go this way. Don't buy the non-physical Jesus. Don't listen to these Gnostics and their strange teachings. Um, don't do that. But then he says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Meaning, if you've already believed that Jesus is the Son of God, you've believed the gospel, you're in Christ. Um, please don't get led astray by these clowns who are teaching this non-physical Jesus crap. Um, and, and they've actually written their own gospels to back it up and everything. There's the Gnostic gospels. I actually have a copy of them. They are shocking. Uh, you know, they've, they've done all that. He's like, please don't listen to that. Please don't follow that. You know better than that. But if anyone does, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And then he says here, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Um, propitiation means final atonement or final appeasement, something along that lines. Uh, now, some translations will actually say atonement here, but that's wrong. The word is not atonement. If we go back to the original text, it's not propitiation either. It's a Greek word that means propitiation. Um, but it doesn't mean atonement. It doesn't mean atonement because atonement does show up in the New Testament, referencing um, different different things. But um, propitiation is a very special word. It's only in the text a couple of different times, um, exclusively talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a final atonement. It's never going to have to happen again. This was eternal. It's eternal peace uh, was was secured at the cross. He's saying Jesus is that peace. He is that propitiation for our sins, us being those who are in Christ, and not only for ours, but actually for everybody else, actually for the sins of the entire world. Um, this is, this is interesting here. Uh, this is something that get, gets debated even within grace, uh, circles. I think that Calvinists have really enjoyed this. They, they say that, um, well, they have a whole way that they explain this away. I don't know if they enjoy it. That's probably the wrong way to put it. Um, because this verse will get kind of brought up sometimes to push back on their version of predestination where God selects some people and other people he doesn't. They'll say Jesus was actually the propitiation for everything. Um, so I don't think they enjoy that. I think that's the wrong way to put it, but they have this all explained away and they say that no, actually it's just limited atonement. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's really not what it says here. I've actually watched John MacArthur say that. Um, I, I, I saw somebody ask him that question and he said, he said, so I guess what would be, what would you be saying here then? He's like, if, if, if that's what it means, that Jesus is the propitiation for everyone's sins, uh, Christian and non-Christian, he's like, he says, he's like, then everybody goes to heaven, right? And, and this lady who was asking him, she kind of backed down a little bit. Um, and it's hard not to because John, I don't want to rant on this. This is not what we're talking about today. But um, you ever seen John's pulpit? It's like a throne. He's like elevated way up above. You know, he has people come forward and they, they take the microphone. I, I, I'd like to ask a question. And he's like, what is it? And then they ask a question like this, you know, and then he... He talks down to them from this from this lofty position. So as anyway, it's it's hard not to. It's not. A, I wouldn't imagine this is a remarkably comfortable environment. Um, but but anyway, uh, she says this. She says, "Okay, what about this?" And he says, "Well, if that's true, if if what it says there is true, essentially, he says, then everybody goes to heaven because uh, Jesus took away all sins for everybody, whether they believe or not." And he says, "So it can't mean that. It has to mean only the elect. This is only talking about the elect." Uh, strange because it doesn't say anything like that. It says he's old, he's the propitiation for our sins and for everybody else's. Uh, so how do we what do we do with that? Because um, that's what John's saying. MacArthur's wrong. Apostle John is right. Uh, so what what do we do with that? Well, universalism would like this because they say everybody's forgiven. Then and actually that's true. Everybody is forgiven, um, but being forgiven of sins is not 
equivalent to being saved, being in Christ, having eternal life. What we find when we read a little bit further is that the sacrifice of Christ was once for all time. It was for everybody. It was for every single sin. Jesus became sin. Uh, God made him who knew no sin to be, to be sin for us. Jesus became sin. The Lamb of God took away the sins of the world. All of them, every single sin was taken, absorbed at the cross. The full wrath of God was felt um, for believer and unbeliever. But the gospel has always been looking to the son and believing that, um, believing that he did do this, that he is who he says he is. Um, it wasn't just this was automatic, this was for everybody, um, and that's, that's all that was ever, that's all that it ever was. It was just Jesus came, he saved everybody, it's universalism, everybody goes to heaven. Um, it's not that. It's Jesus did do that. He did put away sin once by the offering of himself, as Hebrew says. He did do it once for all time. He was sufficient to do that. He was able to do that. Uh, but salvation comes through believing in him. Uh, like about 138 different times the New Testament says that either directly or indirectly. That's a lot of times. It's a lot of times that it's pointing toward faith in Jesus Christ. This is how uh, one is saved. So it's complicated. You know, I, it, it, the kind of the way I've talked about this before, uh, a couple Bible studies when I've been talking about this, this is, this is hard. This is, this is a hard topic. You know, if everybody's sin is taken away, people aren't going to be judged based on their sins, Right. And that's very different than what we've heard. Very, very different. Uh, Christians are judged by their sins, according to what we've heard. Um, not, not just the unbeliever, but also the Christian would be judged according to their sins. I've said this, and you, just let me know if this makes sense. I've said this. On Judgment Day, the question could not be whether or not you sinned. Did you sin or did you not? And that's what you're going to be judged on. Uh, because really, the answer would be yes for absolutely everyone. Because um, everyone has sinned. We know that. Um, the question, the merit, is rather Jesus Christ. It's, did you look to the Son and believe in him, or did you not? Um, Jesus tells us that in Matthew 7. He says, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but only those who do the will of my Father. Uh, he also tells us in John chapter 6 exactly what that is. Uh, my Father's will, he says, is that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Jesus says later on that his sheep know him and he knows them. Um, he knows the ones that belong to him. What you have at the judgment day, you have several different pictures of it throughout the gospels and the epistles, but you have Jesus himself actually separate the sheep from the goats. Um, he, he's the merit. He knows his sheep, his sheep know him. So it's not sins. It's not, well, now everybody gets to line up and talk about their sins that they've done. Um, that would be an enemy of the cross, that kind of a teaching, because that's all been dealt with. And if we're digging that back up, and we're holding that against people. Well, there's, gosh, there's a lot of scripture that says just the, just the polar opposite of that. Um, that the sins are remembered no more. This, this is actually a propitiation. This is actually a final appeasement, a final atonement uh, for sins. Jesus really did take away the sins of the world. He was successful with all of this. Um, so Judgment Day, I think, just looks so different. Uh, so, so different than, than how it's traditionally taught. Uh, I did a couple of videos. I think they're on, they're on, well, they're on, they're on YouTube, but um, I think they're called the Survival's Guide to Judgment Day. And essentially what I did is I gathered up every New Testament scripture that talks about this and I tried to organize it and say like, you know, these are, this is probably describing the same thing. This is probably describing the same thing. It's an opinion piece. I mean, it's, it's listen to it, decide what you think. It's not, and I cracked the code on it and this is exactly how it's going to go. It's, it's not that it's just, this is my research, you know? Um, but Regardless, what we know is as the children of God, we can have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like Jesus. We never need to fear judgment day. We do not need to fear any wrath or any kind of, um, any kind of uh, um, some sort of, I don't know, uh, anger or something we've irritated God with now that we have to answer for. Um, another thing I hear a lot is, uh, this comes from the Gospel of Matthew, actually, that we're going to have to answer for every careless word we've spoken. Uh, not if we're in Christ. Again, Jesus is talking to the self-righteous people that are looking to the law for their righteousness or they're looking to themselves for their righteousness or whatever. Um, not us. We're looking to him for our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Um, so, um, no, again, not our situation. So any, anyway, uh, summing all that up to move on here, Jesus is the propitiation for not only our sins, but also the sins of the entire world. Um, sin was knocked out at the cross. It was that the, the law of sin and death is, is taken away at the cross. And now we have the law of the spirit that gives life. Look to the son and believe in him. So he comes down here in verse three and he says, um, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Uh, the one who says I have come to know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever follows his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought to um, himself walk just as he walked. 
And that's New American Standard, but really it's saying, um, I think the NIV says, um, anyone who claims to live in him must live like Jesus did. I think that's a little easier, and that's, that's how NIV puts it. So uh, first, first three here, let's tackle this one, because uh, this, this is something that essentially you, you might get, if you're ever teaching freedom from the law, and this is coming, if you're ever teaching freedom from the law, freedom from maybe specifically the Ten Commandments, because uh, usually, don't mean this in a bad way, but usually there's not a ton of knowledge that there's more than the Ten Commandments. Uh, so if you're, if you're teaching freedom from the law, and, uh, you know, however this is going to go, eventually you're going to be First John 2, 3, or, or well, yeah, 2, 3, I think that's what it is, uh, where they say, um, we know, we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. They're going to say, those are the law. That's the commandments of Moses. But we do need to keep reading because in chapter 3, John's going to tell us plainly what these commandments are. These are the commandments of Christ, um, to believe in the Son and to love one another. It's very different. John tells us that. Uh, it's in the end of chapter 3. So this is not advocating for keeping the law, the law of Moses. And that's how we know the true Christian keeps the law of Moses. It's not what this is saying in any way, shape, or form. Now, the true Christian actually upholds the law. If we want to go, if you want, if you want to really blow someone's mind um, that's, that's, that's telling you this, uh, well, we know we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. So there you go. We have to keep the Ten Commandments. Um, tell them that Romans says, by faith we uphold the law and that the full righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled in us. Um, we are, we're the walking fulfillment of the law of Moses. Tell them that. Uh, show them those scriptures. Um, that would be, be an interesting conversation there. So uh, he says in verse 4 here, The one who says, I have come to know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, knowing that those commandments are not, are not the commandments of Moses, because here's the thing. Uh, there was a semblance of that, of people who kept the commandments of Moses. There was a semblance of it. No one actually ever kept the law. We know that. Um, no one will ever be declared righteous by the works of the law because no one ever was actually able to keep the whole thing. So we know that. Um, but people had a semblance of it. You know, they kept some of the commandments. Uh, but this isn't talking about that at all because, uh, you know, somebody could make an argument by that. I'm keeping some of the law, so I know him, whatever. But again, wrong law. The one who says, I have come to know him, but does not keep his commandments, Christ's commandments of believing and loving is a liar and the truth is not in him. Truth being Jesus himself, the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is not in this person because he's not, he's, he hasn't believed in the son of God and he doesn't love one another. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cut and dry there. So the truth is not in this person. He says later on here, but whoever follows his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. Uh, follows his word, keeps his commandments, loving from the heart. Um, God's love has been poured out in the ch child of God's heart. And that and God's love flows from the child of God's heart. Uh, he goes down here and he says in verse 7, Behold, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. Uh, the old commandment is the word which you have heard. So I could also see confusion here. Um, I'm not giving you a new commandment, but an old one. And somebody might enjoy saying, oh, there you go. It's, you know, it's the old commandments. It's the Old Testament commandments. It's the law of Moses. There they are. Um, an old commandment, which you've had from the beginning. But what's the beginning? Um, what is the beginning? The beginning of what? And he says, uh, the old commandment is the word which you've heard. He's talking about the gospel, the old message. I'm not, I'm not giving you a new commandment. I'm reminding you of the authentic is what he's saying here. I'm reminding you of where you began. The Gnostics are in here. They're trying to pervert. They're trying to change the gospel here to this strangeness with this non-physical Jesus. Uh, this the Gnostic uh, is a slant of the Greek word gnosis, which means hidden knowledge. They're introducing new gospels. They're telling all these things that aren't true. I'm not writing you a new commandment. I'm reminding you of what you already heard, an old commandment. You've had that from the beginning. Um, remain in him. And he's going, he's going on with that. So that's really what he's talking about there in light of everything that's going on. Um, he says here in verse 8, he says, On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Um, so he's saying, I am. And on the other hand, he's like, I'm not writing a new commandment, but maybe I am. Uh, maybe I am writing a new commandment. Um, I, so I can hear that a couple different ways, and you'll just have to kind of decide what you think there, because I'm not entirely sure... He says, I'm not writing an old commandment, okay? I'm not writing an old commandment. I'm reminding you of what you already know. Is it possible that when he says here, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment, um, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing, um, could be a couple things. Uh, he's saying this new commandment's already true. Maybe this is the same thing. Uh, he's referencing that Jesus referred to this as a new commandment. Or is he talking to perhaps 
unbelievers that could also be grouped in here. He's saying kind of to you who know this, I'm not writing a new commandment. Uh, but maybe I am if somebody doesn't know this. Um, I, could, I hear that a bunch of different ways. I'm not entirely sure what direction he's taking there. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of one of those things we'll just have to, I'd have to study that further and really dive into, okay, why the back and forth here, John? Like, what are, what are you telling us here? Uh, he says here in verse nine, the one that says he is in the light and yet hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. What First John is, interestingly enough, is actually an epistle written to identify the children of God versus the children of the devil, or more simply put, um, believers versus unbelievers. It's actually written to identify that. Here's what a believer looks like, and it's all about Jesus, because uh, John is just laser focused on Jesus and all his writings. Um, and here's what an unbeliever looks like. And here's kind of the first, he's given you, well, he gave you kind of some, some appetizers, uh, you know, but here's, he's given you a, kind of the first direct statement. Here's what an unbeliever looks like. Uh, the one who says he is in the light, yet hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. Because hate would be so foreign for the child of God. Um, we, again, we have God's love poured out in our hearts. He says later on in this very letter that God is love. Um, we love one another from the heart. Um, love is our, is our default setting as the children of God. And he's saying that, you know, someone who says that they're a child of God, but they're, they hate, they're hateful toward people. Um, no, they're, they're still, they're still wandering around in the darkness. So he's kind of giving some indication here, um, that that's one way to tell here is, is when you don't see that love coming from somebody. And I know that, you know, Romans says, don't say in your heart who shall ascend and who shall descend. I, I really think that's in uh, more or less a judgmental way. Like we're going around and we're pointing out, you know, how that person's, um, that person's going to hell. How, you know, if we, we want to say it in a really rude way, like we hear sometimes, like, oh, that person's definitely going to hell or something, you know, that kind of a thing. It's like, don't, don't put yourself in that judgment seat. Uh, who are you to judge another person's servant to their own master? They'll stand or fall and they will stand because God was able to make them stand is what Paul says when he says that in Romans chapter 10. Um, but all that being said, it's okay for us to know you know, who, you know, is on, on a personal level, it's okay for us to, to, to listen to, to, you know, John's teachings here and say, this is some of the things to look out for when you have somebody saying that they're in the light, but yet they're hateful. Um, ask questions there because that shouldn't be, you, you, that's, that's an oxymoron. You have, you have you, light and darkness have no fellowship. Uh, Paul says, what harmony is there between light and darkness? Absolutely none. So they're claiming to be in the light, uh, but they're acting like they're in the darkness. Um, check that, check that. Don't, don't, maybe don't take that at face value. So he goes down here in verse 10, he says, the one who loves his brother and sister remains in the light and there is nothing to cause in him to cause him stumbling. Um, this is an important verse just because of what we have going on with the misunderstanding of Romans chapter seven, where, oh, I know no good thing dwells within me. That's within my flesh or sinful nature. If we go with NLT and NIV there, um, but actually, when it talks about the child of God here, it says there's nothing in them to cause them to stumble. There's no sinful nature. There's no evil side to them. There's not sin living within them. The body of rule by sin was done away with, is what the past chapter says. We're no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. That's an abolished system. Um, so there's none of that. And here's kind of another verse we can go to and say, well, now hang on, there's nothing in us to cause us to stumble. So how could there be sin living within us? And that is what's causing us to stumble. You see, these scriptures don't work together. Maybe we have the wrong interpretation of Romans chapter seven. There's no way to harmonize this. Um, so this is another one of those good scriptures for that. Uh, he says here in verse 11, but the one who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Again, while love is a telltale sign for the child of God, uh, because again, God living in us, God is love. Um, God's love has been poured out in our hearts. So while love is, a, is an indicator that somebody is in Christ, um, hate, on the other hand, being the opposite of that is an indicator that somebody is not in Christ. They're in the darkness. They're, they're wandering around in the darkness. They're lost. Um, so he's, 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 he's telling you that. He's setting that up there. Um, he says uh, down here. So this is, uh, this is interesting here. So starting in verse 12, he starts going through this thing where I'm, I'm writing to you children. I'm writing to you fathers. Um, what is he talking about here? I'm going to read it in two different translations. Uh, let's read it in, first of all, a New American Standard. So we really get the accurate word-for-word um, -word picture of it right here. So he says in verse 12, I am writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Um, 1 John 2.12 is essential to team up with 1 John 1.9. 
Um, I'm writing to you because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. If in 1 John 1, 9, if he's really telling us that we need to constantly be going back to God, God and trying to get more forgiveness from him, then why does he say later on, your sins have already been forgiven in account of his name? Why does he do that? Um, that's, that's two different messages then. If that's what he meant in 1 John 1, 9, then why does he say this? These are opposing ideas. They conflict one another. Um, it's because 1 John 1, 9 is, of course, an invitation to be in Christ, um, where, where 1 John 2, 12 is now this is who you are in Christ. Uh, this is this is now you've already done that. You've done the will of the Father. You've looked on the Son and believed in him, and your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. He says down here in 13, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I am writing to you children because you know the Father. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God remains in you and you have overcome the evil one. Uh, so kind of different, a lot of different family uh, dynamics being brought up there, children, father, uh, uh, that, that kind of a thing. Uh, I, I think what my takeaway from that would be is, is the descriptions of all of these would be people who are in Christ. Um, but the descriptions of, of what that looks like, uh, what he's saying there, you know, you've overcome the evil one. You know the father. You, you do know him. You know him because you know the son. You know God. Um, everything he's saying there. Uh, now, but what does he mean and why the different levels of family there? Why father? Why children? Why all this? I'm going to offer a theory on this. This actually comes from the NLT translation, Okay. And I looked this up in the original text and it's not there. So NLT was trying to help when they came up with this, but this does make sense. I'm going to read this exact same thing in NLT. NLT puts this to the way that they, they, they interpreted this was that these were people who had different maturity levels in the faith. Seems to kind of make sense to me. Again, that's their interpretation because I did check and it is not in the original text. It says exactly what New American Standard says there. So this is if you want to go this direction and say, okay, yeah, I think that might be what it is. Maybe he's talking to different levels of maturity. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's very plausible. Let me read it to you. He says, starting in verse 12, NLT says this, I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith instead of fathers uh, because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I am writing to you who are young in the faith instead of children, um, because you have won your battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith, again, that would be fathers in the, in the NASB, because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith, that would have been children, uh, God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. Makes sense to me. Uh, that, that makes sense to me that this might be different levels of maturity in the faith. Again, that's their interpretation of it. So we just have to decide what we think there. You know, is that, is that accurate or is it not? Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning because I kind of, like I said, it kind of made sense to me. Uh, going down here to verse 15, uh, he says, Do not love the world nor things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Um, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. Uh, literal translation just says the one who does the will of God lives forever. A um, couple things I want to point out there. Don't we get lectured about the world um, in, in church? Don't we, don't we get hit with that? Well, are you, are you living like the world? Are you doing this with the world or that with the world? We make it whatever we want to make it, okay? We must look at John 17. And what does Jesus say? They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He's praying that we are not taken out of the world, uh, but we're kept safe from the evil one. We are not of the world. We live in the world. We're not of the world. Um, saying, don't, don't love the things of the world. You're set apart from that. You're sanctified from the world. You absolutely are. You're in Christ. Uh, for your sake, Jesus says, I sanctify myself um, so that they truly might be sanctified. I set myself apart so they truly might be set apart. Um, so we're not we're not of the world. We, we are not that. So when we get lectured, our, you know, um, or, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think it's just important to look at John 17 because if we get lectured that like, oh, well, you're, you know, you're loving the things of the world or the, you know, watch out for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Again, we've believed in the son of God. We're set apart from all of that. Um, not our story, um, but it's, it, it's something here, you know, that, that is, it's a, it's a warning because of what you have happening in these churches at this time. You know, it's, it's, it's a warning against these kind of teachings, but as far as the child of God, 
and not something we necessarily need to worry about as far as I'm concerned, just teaming that up with John 17. Uh, I've also heard this. Uh, I've also heard this. I've heard that, you know, again, we can use this any way we want when we don't care about the context, but I've heard that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, I've heard a lot of people say, well, that's exactly how the devil tempts. Um, that's exactly how he tempts. He uses those three things, and that might be true. But again, we're set apart from all of that. Um, we don't have lustful flesh. Um, there is the flesh, the the symbol of what's external, sarks. We've already been circumcised from that. Um, so rather than, I think, preach on watch out for this, because that's usually how I've heard it, watch out for this, I think it would be more important to to preach on you're already set apart from this. This is the way of the world and this is all passing away. And I really think that's what John's saying here. I don't think this is a for the child of God and be careful. Um, I think it's, this is the way of the world. Some among you are in this, but you're not. You've already been taken out of this. You've been set apart from this. Uh, so he says here in verse 18, he says, children, it is the last hour and you heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, Many, many antichrists have appeared. From this we know it is the last hour. Uh, that word, antichrist, um, antichristo. Uh, what's, what's interesting, and, and of course, literally, that would just mean against Christ, against Christ. Um, the, the revelation people, and I don't mean anything bad by that, but the revelation people, um, the antichrist, right? This, this Antichrist is coming. He's going to be the president of the United States, probably, right? So, of course, it's going to be that, um, you know, and uh, you, you guys have heard all this, so we don't need to go into that. Um, that is really not how Scripture presents the Antichrist. First of all, here's an interesting fact. Antichrist is never mentioned not a single time in the book of Revelation. Not even one mention of Antichrist, okay? So, it's so funny when we hear Antichrist, we think of Revelation um, in the end times, Okay. Never once is there an Antichrist mentioned in Revelation. This is where the Antichrist is mentioned. But it's not Antichrist singular. It's Antichrist's plural. There's many of them. Anyone who denies that Jesus is the Son of God is an Antichrist. They're against Christ. Um, this is a spirit. It's a deceiving spirit. It's perhaps the spirit of, of humans. Uh, it could have perhaps be that corrupted spirit of, of, of mankind. Um, but anyway, you slice it. This is something that's already here. Um, this is this was here 2,000 years ago, the spirit of the Antichrist, uh, the against Christ, the unbeliever. So the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. And by this, by the coming of the Antichrist, we know this is the last hour. The end times, the last days, the last hour, however scripture puts it, and it puts it a lot of different ways, um, traditionally gets thought of something as in the future. You know, well, we're going to get into the end times, you know, maybe perhaps when different things happen, we're going to say, okay, well, these are now the end times. Really, the way scripture puts this, though, is the last days began right after the cross. Um, after Jesus rose from the dead, those are the last days. Um, those are the end times. Those are the last hour. It's the last hour um, right after Jesus rose from the dead. And this 2,000 years ago. It's, it's been the last days, the last hour, the end times for, for 2,000 years. Not really something that's coming in the future. That's not really how that is presented. Um, so going down here, uh, he says, where were we at here? Okay, so the Antichrist is coming. He says here in verse 19, um, many Antichrists have come and by this we know it's the last hour. Now here's an interesting bit of scripture. He says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be evident that they all are not of us. Uh, talking about kind of the, the origin of this against Christ spirit actually was among the children of God. Uh, it, it appears so. The way that John's saying this, they went out from us, but they never really belonged to us. Because if they had, they would have remained with us. But their going shows that none of them ever really belonged to us. So, this is um, a little bit of scripture that I kind of use personally. Doesn't mean this is how to use the scripture. Doesn't mean that. This just means how I use it personally. When it comes to those who we grew up with, and I, I grew up in a Christian environment, a Christian church, Christian school, most of which, the, most of the people that I, I did grow up, in, grow up with, rather, and were friends with, um, had an appearance at one time of godliness and have completely since abandoned the faith, have become atheists, uh, most of them. Most of, the, most of us church kids did that. Um, because again, when it's the sinner's prayer, when it's the strange Jesus who doesn't save you from sin and doesn't save you from death, 
Um, there is a ton of opportunity for that. There's a ton of opportunity. We were, you know, most of us, not me personally, but pretty much everybody else actually was baptized, participated in all the, the church stuff, but never was in Christ. Uh, and that's that that can very much happen. Uh, both my wife and I were like that too. We we were raised in, in that environment. We did all the things. My wife was on a worship team and everything. She was a prayer warrior. She's holding people's hands and praying with them and was never in Christ the entire time because she never believed in Jesus. And she'll tell you that. And she'll, she'll, talk, she'll tell you all about that. I did all those things, memorized all that scripture, read my Bible, and was never in Christ. Never looked to the Son and believed in him. That's very, very common. It's common in the first century. And John is saying the telltale sign of that of when somebody was illegitimate the entire time is they go out from you. Uh, they never belong to you. Their going shows that. So how I hear that and how I interpret that myself is if if one is in Christ, one remains forever in Christ. And scripture says that one remains forever. This is eternal life. It's eternal. You know, Christ is your life and it's eternal. And he is eternal. He lives forever. He has the power of an indestructible life. Um, Jesus, no one can snatch you from his hand. He says that in the Gospel of John. No, no one is able to snatch you from his hand. Certainly not the devil. Certainly not the world. It's not possible. Um, so when you have somebody who has an appearance of godliness and walks away from that, you got to be careful with this because Christians can get discouraged. That They can get discouraged. They can get angry with God. That can all happen. But a complete abandonment and saying, I no longer believe. I don't believe in Jesus. I, you know, I don't, I do, I do not believe, you know, saying all those things. Um, and it's just, that's all fake. That was all fairy tales. Um, that to me is very hard to believe that that person was ever in Christ. Me personally, that's very, very hard for me to believe that. I know that, you know, there's, there's different teachers that say different things on that. And they'll say, well, no, because, you know, if they, if they, if they ever believed, then they're, then they're in Christ. Correct. If they ever did, um, but they're saying they didn't. Um, they're they're going out from us. It's my assumption that they never really belonged to us. I had a pastor, incidentally, uh, just throw this out there. When I was younger, a teenager, I had a pastor that was uh, a great guy, still is, I'm sure. I don't know him now, but still is. And a very, very nice, very caring, very kind uh, was on a worship team. He was a pastor, so he's preaching. He's preaching right out of the scriptures, telling us all about Jesus and everything. Uh, he's an atheist today. Uh, he says that, you know, he's become fully convinced that Jesus is not the son of God. He's fully convinced uh, that, that that's not true. None of none of this was true. Uh, he's completely back backpedaled on all of it. It's not true. Um, what do you do with that? And he's saying he doesn't believe that Jesus is the son of God. I don't believe that, he's saying. That's not true. Um, so so are, are we to look at that person and say that they're in Christ? Uh, well, he, he still is. He's just confused. No, I don't think so. I think he's he's telling us where he's at. He's telling us, and I think what we saw before was when he was among us. He went out from us. He never really belonged to us. Never really belonged is the key word there. Not they went out from us, but they did belong to us. You could lose your salvation. It's not that. Um, it's they never had salvation. They did the works. They did the church stuff. They had an appearance of godliness, but never were legitimate. Um, that's very, very common. That was me. Um, that, that was me. You know, I, I did the prayer circles. I did the whatever you have it. I memorized the scripture. I used to be in a program called Awana. Approved workmen are not ashamed. I used to be in a program called Awana at my church where you memorized. It's like the Christian Boy Scouts, but you memorize a bunch of verses. You get candy, you get badges, you get all this stuff. I did all that. Um, never belonged, never believed in Jesus the entire time. It's very, 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 very possible to do that. The gospel is easy to miss. Um, it's a stumbling block even. It's referred to as that. The gospel is actually a stumbling block. Um, because it's so simple and because it's by grace through faith, it becomes a stumbling block. It's too simple. It's too easy. Um, it can't be that good. There must be a catch. And people miss the gospel all the time because of that. So uh, going down here, he says... Um, Okay, so we got to, we're at verse 20 here right now. Let me check the time. Okay, so I think we'll be able to get through the rest of this and I'll get, I'll read all your comments here. Um, he says here, um, so he, he's talking about them. He says, you know, they went out from us so that it would be evident that they never belonged to us. He's saying the reason they left is so we would know that they were illegitimate. But he says here in verse 20, speaking about the children of God, he says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you and, and you all know you all know the truth, rather. I'm, I stumbled on that a little bit because I'm so used to NIV. But he's saying, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Um, he says in verse 21, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? 
except the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So he's saying the only lie here, really, you, you, first of all, he's saying you, you, you're not, you've not believed the lie, you've believed the truth, you've believed in Jesus, but the only lie here is anyone who denies that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, such a person is the Antichrist. And incidentally, that's why I have such a, tr- a, tr- a troubling time with if we have somebody who had an appearance of godliness in the past, but they're saying Jesus is not the Son of God. They're saying that I don't believe that. There is just no plausible way in my mind that that person was ever in Christ. I, I just don't, I just don't, I'm not on board with that. That, that. that this could have been somebody who is, they're just confused. Or No, I, they're saying they don't believe. Um, they're, they're the liar, they're the antichrist. They've always been the antichrist, even when they had an appearance of being in Christ. Um, so he's saying, uh, which, what, something else um, that's interesting here, he says, the, one who, the antichrist is the one who denies the father and the son. Um, a denial of Jesus is a denial of the Father as well. And he says that in the next verse here, verse 23, he says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. I think the reason something like this would be written is kind of for religions that, like Judaism, for example. Judaism, traditionally, is all about Yahweh, the Father, right? Um, But completely denies Jesus Christ as the Messiah, Okay? No one who denies the Son has the Father. So there's not some special way that, well, yeah, but you know, they're, they believe in God. No, they don't. They've denied the Son of God. They don't believe in God. If they believed in God, they would believe in his Son. Uh, Jesus says that. If you believed in God, you'd believe me. Um, you would, uh, but you don't because you don't believe in him. Um, you, you don't. If you believed Moses, he says, you'd believe me. Um, if, if Abraham were your father, you'd listen to me. Uh, he's, he says that, I, I, you know, but you don't when he's, when he's going back and forth with these Jews. Um, so at any rate, no one, there's no one who has denied Jesus Christ that, also, that somehow is in with God. Uh, I think he's saying, I know that's the, the only way that you are um, accepted, um, or I don't know if that's the right word, but the only, essentially no one comes to the Father let's just let scripture say it, except through Jesus Christ. Um, and, and what can happen there, I think, and I hear this a lot. I hear this a lot. I share this with you guys. I hear this phrase that believing in God is somehow salvation. I hear that all the time. And I point it out every single time that that is probably the most dangerous. It's actually false. You can actually use this. The most, the, probably the most dangerous false gospel, false message out there because it sounds right. It sounds so correct. Oh, they believe in God, so they're saved. No, they're not. Do they believe in Jesus Christ? Have they looked to the Son and believed in him? Have they done the will of the Father? Um, Believing in God doesn't do anything on its own. And I do want to point that out all the time because that so gets blurred with the gospel. And it gets taught, oh, do you believe God or do you not? That's not the question. The question is, have you looked to the Son and believed in him? Um, Most people believe in God. There's a general faith in God out there. Most people have that. I think I personally think everybody has that, but that's me. Um, but most people, if you ask them if they believe in God, they usually will say yes. Um, that doesn't do anything. That does not save the demons believe in God. Uh, that doesn't save anyone. Believing in Jesus and who he says he is, is saving. Um, so going down here a little bit, uh, he says, where were we at here? Okay. So he says, um, who is the liar except that one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Um, he says, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Again, it's all through the Son. Salvation comes through the Son of God. He says in verse 24, As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If what you heard from the beginning remains in you, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. What have you heard from the beginning? The gospel, the message about Jesus. See that that remains in you. Now it will. It's not like worry about it because it's going to depart from you. Um... But as long as you have believed in Jesus Christ, which apparently these people have that he's speaking to directly here, um, you will remain in the Son and and in the Father. Um, And he says down here, and this is what he himself has promised us, eternal life. Uh, This is the promise you will remain in this life. You have the life of Christ. You are in Christ who is in the Father. Uh, So verse 26 is really important too. uh, When it comes to the entire context of 1 John, specifically the first chapter, he says here, these things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Some translations will say trying to lead you astray. 
I've written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Who would that be? The Gnostics, the people that are teaching this non-physical Jesus, this docetism as it's called. Jesus isn't real, um, or at least he was some kind of a spiritual phantasm. Uh, he didn't die on a cross. There's no such thing as sin. Everything the Gnostics are teaching, he's saying, I'm writing this letter to you about them, those who are trying to lead you astray. So he does say that. It's right here. Um, but then he says, as for you, in verse 27, the anointing which you received from him remains in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, it is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, remain in him. So the anointing is so interesting. In the Old Testament, we have anointings with oil and things like that. Um, those are all shadows, all pictures of things that were to come. But the true anointing, the one we have in the New Covenant, there's only one, and it's the receiving of the Holy Spirit. We are God's anointed. Uh, we, we have his spirit living within us. Um, he's saying in that anointing, the Holy Spirit, is, is um, you, you don't need anyone to teach you because you have him. Um, he teaches you all things and he reminds you about Jesus is what the Gospel of John says. It's part of his ministry. The Holy Spirit is to teach you. He's your teacher. He's your helper. He's your advocate. Um, he's, he's all those things. Um, he, so again, human teachings are, I mean, it's, it, I think it's good to get together and talk about Jesus. We do it all the time. Um, but, they're, but they're human teachings. Uh, are, they, are they necessary? No. I, I think it's great to have the conversations. Is Do you have to do it? Uh, do you need it? Do you need someone to actually teach you the scriptures? Nope. Nope. Because you have, you have the teacher. You have the teacher living within you. Uh, that's always good to remember. Always good to point, to point out to maybe some of our brothers and sisters that kind of get caught in this um, following people. You know, that's easy to do in the church, to become a follower of a person, follower of pastor, follower of some theologian we like, follower of a denomination. It's always important, I think, just to kind of stay grounded here. Might be helpful, might not be, might be more harmful than it is helpful. But at the end of the day, we don't need anyone to teach us. We don't. We, we have the teacher. The teacher lives within us. So, um, you know, he says here, kind of to end this chapter, he says, Now little children remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not draw back from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practice, practices rather righteousness has been born of him. So what about this? Um, remain in him so that we, um, when he appears, you might have confidence and not draw back in shame at his coming. Couple things. Uh, well, first of all, you're always in the son who's in the father if you believed in Jesus. Uh, so really the only thing I could say here, I think there's probably only one way I could interpret this, is it's one of those passages that's kind of an um, evangelistic appeal. We have a lot of those. Uh, continue in what you've heard, remain in him, uh, remain remain with this, remain with this teaching uh, so that when he appears, you won't be ashamed. Uh, and again, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Later on in this same exact letter, um, John's going to say we can have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like Jesus. There's no fear um, coming to the day of judgment. So I think when he says this, He's saying, um, maybe for those of you who haven't fully believed in the gospel, you're kicking it around, you're thinking about it, um, remain and continue in what you've heard, remain in that. Um, don't, don't listen to these people who are trying to lead you astray. That's kind of how I hear that. Again, that's, that's me. That's my interpretation of that. And that's chapter two. So quite a bit, quite a, quite a bit uh, packed into chapter two. Uh, let me jump into your uh, comments here because I saw there was quite a few. Good morning, Manuel. Dinosaurs, Manuel says, uh, we could talk about dinosaurs. We, we could do that. I suppose I could have thrown that in with the Halloween stuff. Um, if, if dinosaurs are monsters, we could have went that, that route with it. That would have been kind of fun. Uh, good morning, Emmanuel. Uh, he says here, okay, is the first chapter of First John written to unbelievers, believers, or both? Well, I think it's written to both, um, but it's not written, it's not describing a child of God necessarily, what you have going on there. Um, it's, I think all scripture is written to believers. It's not, maybe not written like, I wouldn't say it's, well, this was geared, this was all for unbelievers. I think when it was originally penned, we could say that. This is written as a rebuke, a light and polite rebuke to Gnosticism. It is written that way. He says that in verse 26, I've written these things about those who are trying to lead you astray. I mean, he says that that's what it is. Um, but it's written to the believers too, I think, because the believers would read that, and John is reminding them, I've seen Jesus, I've touched him, I've heard him. He was physical. Um, I, I'm testifying to that, John's saying to the believers who would be reading this. He's saying, you guys know the truth. Um, if we claim to be without sin, we make him a liar. The truth is not in us. You know, he's, he's saying, you guys already know this. I'm reminding you of this. Um, so, I, so I think that it is written to believers. I'd say all scripture is written to believers, and this is talking about unbelievers, though. It's talking about a false gospel, a false teaching that's gotten into the church. That'd be my opinion on that. Um, 
there's a context to it, you know? It's, it's just important to know the context there and not take this as every... The big mistake I think we make just as Christianity as a whole is that every single word from Genesis to Revelation is directly describing you, um, everything in there. And that's how we get just so, so many bad teachings. I see them all the time. I follow um, this account on, and I appreciate their work, I do, but I follow this account on Instagram that has a verse of the day. It is almost always Old Testament, almost always Old Testament. And it's like some positive thing they've pulled from like Deuteronomy or First or Second Chronicles, which are largely not positive books. And they pull like one little shred of positive scripture out of there. And then they, they, they read just that. And then they say, and this is saying that the Lord will watch over you and he'll bless you. And I'm like, no, it's not. There, there is a context there, guys. I, I really appreciate what you're doing. You're working really hard on this every day, but this isn't true. Um, at the end of the day, and this is my opinion on it, you're kind of doing a disservice to the body of Christ. You're taking things that were not written to the born-again Christian and you're changing it to where it is, ignoring all the context around it. There's a lot of negative things around that. I mean, why aren't all the negative things written to them? Um, I don't know. I just, I, I dislike it. And that's, that's a humongous problem. A humongous problem in our churches is thinking everything from Genesis to Revelation is all about you, directly written toward you. Um, and it's not. So uh, going down here, Emmanuel says, uh, Scientology is believed to be modern Gnosticism. Uh, you know, I don't know much about it. I don't know much about it, but I've heard the stories with Scientology. Is there a spaceship? Is there like a, is, is there a hydrogen bomb in a spaceship? I mean, is that, is that actually uh, part of Scientology? I don't know. I've heard that humans were basically animals and this, this is what I've heard. I could be a hundred percent wrong with this. And this alien, I guess, named Zenyu, who was part of this galactic federation, um, came down in a spaceship and put spirits in humans something like that. And there was also a hydrogen bomb that went off some, at some point in the book of Genesis. I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's strange, but I could be 100% wrong with that. That's just, I've heard weird things about, about Scientology. So I've heard they have different like secret rituals and, and you know, different bits of knowledge that they give you as, as you progress in Scientology and things like that. So I don't know. I mean, is it is it an evolved Gnosticism? Maybe. Maybe they've it's Gnosticism on steroids. It's like we we found some more Gnosis. We found some more um, hidden hidden gospels here that's even further um, further furthered our knowledge. I have no idea, but it would be interesting. Um, Emmanuel says, "Is there like a religious hate? Like when we hate our sins, or hate is or is hate something that's bad?" Well, it depends. Uh, we have in it's Romans right that says, "Hate what is evil, cling to what is good." Um, there are things God hates, so hate can't be bad. Uh, God, God hates things, and He's He's documented uh, for hating things. Uh, he hates evil. <laughs> he hates He hates what's evil. He detests it. So, so no, I think hatred is positive. Uh, I, I think every emotion is positive. Anger is positive. Um, hatred is positive if it's if, if it's aimed correctly. I think you know because um, it. It causes motivation, and, and maybe this is just my opinion, me talking, um, but hatred will cause will, will almost cause motivation for action. Um, but again, it, what John is saying specifically here in, in chapter 2 is hating people. Um, he's saying watching out, you know, if you have somebody who's claiming that they're in the light, but they hate people and they're hateful toward people, that's a pretty good indication that they're not in the light, they're in the darkness, because Christians should be loving from the heart. Uh, they have God who is love living within them. The love of God has been poured out in their hearts. Um, love is our default setting for the children of God. So if you're seeing hate spewing from somebody who says they're a child of God, they're probably not. Uh, but again, you know, no, we do have hate used in a positive way as well. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. So we do have that. I don't think it's a word we have to run from. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I always heard when I was a kid, you can't say hate at all. Hate's a strong word. You can't say it. And it's like, well, you can say it just maybe in its context. Maybe maybe there's a proper proper use for this. Uh, maybe, you know, you never ever toward a person, of course, um, but maybe, maybe there are things you're allowed to hate. Uh, you're allowed to do that. I personally don't really use the word much. Um, so I won't say like, for an example, if I watch a movie, I won't say I hated that movie. I don't say it because I think it's a serious word and not, oh, it's a strong word and you shouldn't say it. No, I'll say it if I mean it. And if, if there's a context, you know, if there's, you know, within its proper context, I'll use it. Um, but I don't want to use it lightly and say, I hate, I hate this movie. Oh, I hated that, that pizza we got last night. It was disgusting. It's a stronger, it, it is a stronger word for the, than, than a casual context. Um, I'm, I'm starting to sound like a Christian mom right now, aren't I? It, but, but no, it, it is a stronger word for, for, in my opinion, than, than just to throw around in a casual context like that. There's other words I treat that way, incidentally. So let me, let me um, 
Throw some of that in here too, okay? I also don't say holy unless I'm referring to God, Jesus, or us. Um, I'm very careful with that. I don't say holy cow, holy anything else. Um, I, I'm very careful with the use of that word. I used to say it all the time. Um, I'd say holy and I'd throw some curse words in after it and everything. Um, but I, I consider that word to be, let's, let's use it properly. Um, this, is, this is a very big deal. If we, if we use it all the time, um, holy this, holy that, um, it, it, it just degrades it from what it actually means. Um, it, just, it just makes it a common word that gets thrown around. It's describing anything at all, um, usually negative things. And I think it, it loses its meaning when we do that. And this is something that is very, very important. We are holy. And I'll, I'll use holy all day to describe us. I'll use holy all day to describe God or Jesus either way. But I don't think, again, it's not, I don't use it carelessly. It's not a careless word, you know, just throwing that around. I think I hear that all the time um, from people. I don't say anything. I don't, I'm not going around me like you really shouldn't say that. They say whatever they want. It's for freedom that Christ set them free. Um, but I, I do hear that all the time and I, I'm, I don't say it. Um, so that, and that's me personally. It doesn't mean do that. It means that's what I do. Uh, so, all right, uh, going down here, uh, Manuel says the omen comes to mind. I don't remember what you we were talking about there. The omen, like the horror movie? Um, I've seen that, uh, man, it hasn't been a long time since I've seen it. it it's back when I used to, before I knew, uh, Jesus, I used to watch horror movies all the time. And not that that's again, not that I stand in judgment of anyone who's in Christ that likes to watch horror movies. I, I who am I to do that? Um, to watch horror movies. If you want to watch horror movies, I am personally not going to, um, I saw a thing or two. And after that, I didn't ever want to watch a horror movie again. Um, Emmanuel says our brother, Brad Robinson believes in the antichrist revelation. Okay. Check out his post at Freedom in Christ Movement. Oh, a lot of people do. Um, a lot of people do. They're, and you know, in Thessalonians, you have the, the man of, uh, of, uh, of sin, I believe, uh, the, the, the man of lawlessness, depending on your translation. Uh, you have that brought up in Revelation. So sometimes the Antichrist will get blended with that and they'll say this is all one person. Um, I, you know, that's, that's fine. As far as like the, the revelation, you know, the kind of the people that take the little bit more traditional route with revelation, really dispensationalism is what, is what teaches that, the, the uh, thousand year reign of Christ. And that is mentioned in revelation. So it might not be symbolic. It could be actual, um, the thousand year reign of Christ, the mark of the beast, all, all that stuff being actualities, um, a seven year tribulation, the rapture. A lot of these things don't actually show up in the new Testament, but I'm kind of in the whatever camp with that. Just like, I, I, it's just not interesting to me. Like I, it's, it's really not. Um, I'm really wanting, what I've found me personally speaking is, um, a big interest among our brothers and sisters in revelation in the end times. Okay. But also, and I do not mean this in a bad way, a giant ignorance when it comes to the gospel. So a big interest in Revelation. Oh, let's talk about the end times. Let's talk about the rise of the Antichrist, the one world government, all this type, type of stuff. Let's talk about the timelines. Um, but next to no knowledge about the gospel. I find that all the time. So I don't care about Revelation. It's not for us to know, Jesus says, the days or the times. So I, I don't care about that, you know, trying to, trying to decipher this somehow. Not that it's a bad book or anything, but it's, it's definitely the one I spend the least amount of time in. Um, so I don't care about that. I really am passionate about the gospel. Uh, let's talk about Jesus. Let's make sure we got, we got this right. Uh, the end times, end times, if we want to call on that can wait. Uh, that's, that can all wait. That's all secondary information. I, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I don't, I don't get too involved in it. You know, now we have that going on quite a bit, uh, because of what's going on in Israel and Palestine. We have, um, all of that coming out now. Oh, this is, this is it. This is, this is it. Maybe. Okay. I don't really think Israel has any significance. I was talking to you guys about that. I really don't. The the state of Israel, um, we, we got to look at what, what does the New Testament say? Not all who descend from Israel are Israel. They're, the true remnant that was reserved by grace included the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, I don't really see any place anymore for, for an Israel, the people of God. That's all. We're the people of God. Um, Israel was cut out because of unbelief. I, so I, I struggle with all that and saying, and then somehow Israel is important in the future. Um, why? Why they didn't believe in Jesus? Uh, so, yeah, so those are those are things I could, I just can't get on board with. But Israel is usually seen as like a pivotal thing in the end times. Uh, Manuel says whitewash. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, Manuel. I don't remember when we said that. Um, I think we were talking about. I, I know what we're talking about. We were talking about the people who went out from this ecclesia but never belonged to them uh, because if they had belonged to them, they would have remained with them. Manuel was saying uh, whitewash there, uh, meaning that they. 
they were the whitewashed tombs. Probably, I don't mean to speak for you, but that's probably what you were referencing there. What Jesus said, your whitewashed tombs, you're, uh, you're beautiful on the outside, but in, inside you're filled with death and decay. Uh, that's probably what that's a reference to. That was me. Uh, that was me throughout my entire church career. I'm memorizing scripture. I'm doing my devotions. I'm doing the prayer circles, small groups, you name it. My wife, Lena, is doing the exact same thing, only she's leading them. She's holding people's hands and praying for them, praying with them. Neither one of us was ever in Christ because we never believed. We never believed in Jesus. We said the sinner's prayer. We believed in ourselves for salvation. Not that the sinner's prayer, you know, if, if accompanied by belief in Jesus Christ, not that that's not, you were not saved that way, but it's a matter of we turned it into say this and you're saved. Uh, and that's what we did. So we're like, oh, well, we're, we're saved, you know, and I never felt any security with that. I've shared that with you guys. I said it 10 million times, just trying to make something happen. Uh, eventually gave up on it. Uh, but but yeah, all did all the things, did everything, was was totally had an appearance of godliness and was never in Christ. Um, Emmanuel says that went away verse was used by those who don't believe in once saved, always saved, or somebody like us who didn't attend a congregation anymore. Um, so now it's a, now it's a, if you don't go to church, um, you're, you went out from them, but you didn't belong to them. Yeah, I don't think it's talking about that. It's talking about, um, it, it's not, I, I did say ecclesia. Let me back up there. As far as people who profess to have a faith in Jesus, they claimed to be in the light, but yet they walked in the darkness. Um, the reason I said they went out from the ecclesia, meaning that it was observable, like that there were Christians there and they did observe these people exiting. Um, as far as it leaving a church building or leaving a church, uh, no, that would not be evidence in any way, shape or form that somebody's not in Christ. That might be evidence. And I, I don't want to get in trouble for saying, you know, kind of saying this. I don't want to offend anybody, but that might be evidence that they are in Christ if they left a church. Um, I don't mean that in a bad way, but if the church is not preaching the gospel and it's law and it's it's this, do this to please God, do this to be blessed, um, you're a sinner, that might be an evidence that they're like, I'm going to hang on a second. That's that. What you're preaching here, pastor, is not consistent with who I am in Christ. Um, so, yeah, I, I yeah. So when, when John is saying that he is talking about it was observable that they left and they would have remained if they were legitimate. Um, not saying it's because they left the church that um, that they are illegitimate. Uh, it's because they denied that Jesus is the Son of God. He says, you know, he, as, as we keep reading, we realize what they did. They 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 denied Jesus. They said he's not the Son of God. We don't believe. Um, so that's that's what it was. Badges we don't need. Well, you know the rest. <laughs> We don't need your stinking badges. What is that from? That's an old movie. Uh, my, my dad used to watch that movie. I don't remember what that was. Oh, man, was it? Okay, I'm going to throw this out. Tell me, tell me uh, Manuel, if this sounds right. Was it Treasure of Sierra Madre? Was that was that the movie that that's from? I, I don't remember. I just remember that line. Um, it's an old movie. It's like Humphrey Bogart. It's an old, an old movie. Uh, going down here, Emmanuel says, um, been joined in Awana also in the past before I learned grace, a really a legalistic thing. Unfortunately, it is. Um, it's with with the best of intentions. It's, you know, it's it. You don't you don't hear. And I again, probably good intentions. A lot of good people that participate in Awana. If you guys don't know what Awana is, it's an acronym for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed, and. Um, it's it's Christian Boy Scouts. You have the Girl Scouts and you have the Boy Scouts. Um, so it's just Christian Scouts, I guess. But regardless, you have you start when you're really young. You start in like kindergarten, I think. You, you become what they call a Sparky. You get a vest. You can earn all kinds of uh, badges on the vest, and then you, you you move up at that point. I think when I was in it, it was kind of had like an old Western theme with the ranks. So I think there was Pal and there was Brave and Warrior. They're kind of like um, Native American themes there. Um, Regardless, uh, whatever it was, it's there were different ranks, different badges you could earn, and it was all by memorizing scripture and doing stuff. I mean, this is how you you got all these things. And um, I still have my Awana rewards; they're somewhere actually in the garage. Uh, but re regardless, it's all probably with great intentions. Okay, there's very little Jesus taught. It's all about memorizing scripture, doing devotions, things like that. Um, so, is, is there value to it? I mean, it's fun. I remember having great fun with it when I was a kid. Great, great fun with, with Awana. But is there is there any value to it? I don't know. I mean, my wife was in Awana too. Um, she's, she is kind of outspoken against it now. Like now she's thinks much differently of it, now being out of it and looking back at, his, at it as an adult. Um, I don't know. It, like a legalistic thing. It, it's, it's having you do stuff. You know, it's, it's having you do, you know, do these things. Memorizing scripture isn't bad. 
Um, but when it's, if it's presented as you must, you need to do your devotions, you have to memorize scripture, um, I tend not to like that. You know, you have to do this or you don't get these things. Um, I know it's kids, so it's like, well, yeah, but kids, you got to motivate them with something. Yeah, but I, again, I, I kind of dislike it too. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of torn on stuff like that. Like Vacation Bible School was like that too. And I loved Vacation Bible School. Um, you had to you had to do stuff to get stuff. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. Um, but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. So I don't know. I don't remember a lick of what they taught though. Um, I, I remember my devotions. I still probably have my, my Awana stuff somewhere. You know, you could, you could look through that. I did that not too long ago. I looked through some of my old, um, I was in all kinds of different cl uh, clubs and, and different things in churches. And I looked through that and there's just, it's devoid of Jesus. I mean, it's almost all Old Testament. As far as the gospel is concerned, there's hardly anything in there at all. Not that there's nothing. There's hardly anything at all. Uh, gospel rise. Uh, going down, um, Manuel says, it's as if my father, if my own son recognized me, but not my father. Uh, I think when you said that, Manuel, we were talking about anyone who, no one who denies the son has the father is what, is what he says there. No one who denies the son has the father. Um, because these go together. Uh, these, you know, they go together. Um, you know, Jesus is, in, we are in Christ. He says this in John 17, we are in him and he is in the father. Um, he also says, and I think it's John 14, that anyone who loves him, uh, the father will love that person and they will come to them and make their home with them. So we're all one. Uh, we're all one. There's a oneness being communicated there. And so no one who denies the son somehow got to God and they're in the father. No, they're not. Uh, they're in Adam if they've denied the son. So they're in their father, uh, but not, not in ours. Uh, Amber says that can't be real. Oh, what was that about? Um, oh, it was about Scientology. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'm not, a, I, again, I could be completely and totally wrong with that. Um, Google search Zenu. It's spelled with an X. Um, Google search Zenu and his spaceship and everything like that. It's at least out there. Whether or not Scientology actually teaches that, like, if, or if that's just some myth regarding Scientology and they're not, they don't teach that. Um, but look up Zenu uh, because it's it's a real story. It's a real story. And it, it's like, from what I understand, again, could be completely ignorant of this. Maybe I got this wrong. From what I understand, this happens during the events of like Genesis too. So you have you have the the Galactic Federation with the spaceship and the the hydrogen bomb that goes off in the volcano and all of that. Um, it kind of like coinciding with what's going on in, in Genesis. I think so. I think so. It would definitely be interesting. It's an interesting read, uh, whether or not. Um, the it sounds it, it sounds at first like a Star Wars movie. Well, it, I think, and again, I'm not an expert with this, but was not it written as science fiction? I think it was. I think it was written in science fiction and then it kind of got um, adopted. And now we're gonna, it's turning into our religion now. It would be a lot like if we watched Star Wars and then we decided we were Jedi. That's what that would be like. And then we're going to, you know, okay, now, now we're Jedi. We're going to go build a temple. Um, we're going to go sit around in circles on cushions and talk about the Force. That's, that's what it would be like. Like we suddenly identified with science fiction and said, no, this is us. This is what we're going to do. We're peacekeepers. We walk around in the robes and everything. I mean, that, it would be it would be something like that. So, um, Manuel says, "How about OMG?" So, oh my God, um, I don't say that either personally. I used to say that all the time. And again, not standing in judgment of anyone who does. I think it again, it just cheapens. It just cheapens. Uh, you know, it's just one of those those things that just cheapens God. If you're saying, "Oh my God," and you're throwing not that. Uh, some, some folks will say, well, yeah, you shouldn't use the Lord's name in vain. That's not using the Lord's name in vain. And also, we're not under the Ten Commandments. Uh, but regardless, uh, it's, it's, I, don't, it's, I don't think it's really that. I, don't, I really don't think it's that. But it, it's, it's a careless use. And I, and I kind of don't like careless uses. I want to make sure that I'm a little bit more intentional with that. But I used to say that all the time. It was always, always oh my God. This. There's almost an appropriate time to say it, though. Okay, so think about this. And I, I've said this, I've had this conversation with Linda, there's almost an appropriate time to say, oh my God. Um, when I see a really, really bad, like mixed covenant teaching or something or statement like that, I'm like, that's, if you're ever going to say, oh my God, I think that's it. Um, because that's, to me, that's, that's the most appropriate time is because it's, it's relevant. Um, I also, and this is me personally, doesn't mean this is what people should do. Um, I also don't say, um, thank God or anything like that, or oh, thank God, or, you know, so I, I still, it's just like, well, are you thanking God? I, I mean, if, if I'm actually thanking God, then I might, I would say that, but you know, just kind of in a, Oh, thank God I found a parking space. Oh, come on. You 
know, that really, you know, so that, that's, that's how I look at that. I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of just a casual use, isn't it? You're not, you're not really grateful to God that you found a parking space. Also, he had nothing to do with that. This was just, just, just happened to happen. So, um, at least in my opinion, in Jeremiah's opinion. Um, Amber says, in my opinion, I'm not interested in end times. I focus on what I know, who wins, um, and trust Jesus. He's got me. Yes. And that's how I feel about it too. Um, it's just, that's the end times when, when it happens, in my opinion, it's going to look so much different than revelation. It's going to look so much different than that. What we're going to see after it happens is how revelation pointed to it and say, oh, okay. So that's what that meant. Okay, so now, now we get it. We don't get it now. Uh, th that's that's my opinion. We just don't get it now. I compare us to this. Um, the book of Daniel, when you have Nebuchadnezzar has his dream about the statue, okay? And he calls in all the court magicians and he says, interpret this dream for me. Actually, first tell me what it was because I think you guys are a bunch of phonies. But tell me what it was and what it means. And they can't do it. And well, we can't do that, king. No wise man can do that. So they're standing around scratching their beards. And he says, you know what? Cut all these guys' heads off. And not only them, but go throughout the entire country and cut off every person who professes to be a wise man. Cut off all their, all their heads and everything because they're a bunch of fakes. Daniel comes in and, of course, through the spirit of the Lord, he's able to interpret the dream. Um, what I always say is we, when it comes to the book of Revelation, we think we're Daniel that can come in and just say, this is what this means and this is what this means. We're not Daniel, we're the court magicians uh, about ready to get our heads cut off. That's how I feel about our, our revelation teachers. We're the court magicians about, you know, we're standing around, well, no one can do this, king. Why have you asked us? You know, that's, that's really because when, when you look at the interpretations, none of them agree with one another. If this is, if they're interpreting it through the Holy Spirit that lives within them, and that's, you know, they're, they're saying that, and, you know, the Spirit showed me this or showed me that, why is he showing something, somebody like, why is none of it consistent? Um... I don't know, why does none of it, it maybe not has to be perfectly consistent, but why does none of it work at all together? Why are people biting and devouring each other over it? Um, God's a God of order, not of disorder. So I just, I'm not interested. I'm with you on that, Amber. I'm just really not interested in that a whole lot. Um, it's gonna, whatever, how it, how it goes, it's gonna go, but we know the ending. You know, we know that Jesus wins. We, we, so amen to what you said there. Um, Amber, uh, I'm sorry, by Grace New Covenant says, um, who has already won? Yes, Jesus has already um won that. Um, Manuel says, I walked out of Walmart. Does that mean I wasn't a customer? Talking about leaving church, does that mean you weren't in Christ? <laughs> uh, that's, well, um, if you walked out of Walmart, does that mean you weren't a customer? Yeah, so like, if you walk out of church, does that mean you were never a Christian? Oh, well, of course you are. You know, of course you are. You might have left for good reasons. Um, that's a good, that's, that's actually, that's a great, um, that's an, a great analogy. Uh, uh, Manuel says, uh, yes, and blazing saddles for the line. Uh, we don't need no stinking badges. Okay. I don't think I've seen blazing saddles. Um, I, it's probably an older movie. I don't think I've seen that one. Um, by grace, new covenant says regarding words like holy, I am trying not to carelessly use such either. And if I happen to slip up with this and I feel quite annoyed about myself regarding that, you know, it's, it's a personal thing. You know, if that's, that's up to us, if we want to say holy in, oh my God, or however we want to talk, it's really, um, we're free. We're free people. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, so like me personally, I choose not to do it, but that, you know, does that mean that's, and, and everybody needs to do that and make sure, no, it, you're free. You're free to say what you want to say. Um, but I just, like I said, for me personally, I don't feel super great. And I'm with you on that uh, by Grace New Covenant. I, I kind of am like, eh, I don't know. I want to make sure I'm speaking a little differently. You know, I'm taking these things seriously. I'm not just throwing them around. Um, me personally, doesn't mean that's a blueprint for people to follow. So, okay, guys. Well, thanks so much. I know we went over, but I really enjoy the, the conversation. So uh, thanks thanks so much um, for, for, for uh, chiming in and for just uh, just having this fellowship. Uh, Amber, I'll read your comment here because uh, I just saw it popped up. It says, it's hilarious. Oh, man, cancel culture <laughs> would have a heyday with blazing saddles. Okay, so it's, it's one of those older movies that has a lot of things in it that you're just like, oh, wow. Okay, that's definitely a period piece. So, okay, well then, I don't know, maybe if it's on some streaming platform, I'll check it out. So, uh, even, even okay, honestly though, I'm going to say this real quick because I know we got to go, but even the Disney movies from the 90s, <laughs> you start watching those and be like, wow, there's, wow, how culture has changed here. <laughs> so, but, um, all right, guys, well, th well thanks so much. Um, thanks so much, and I will see you tomorrow where, uh, for, uh, I guess we'll do First John uh, chapter 3. So, have a great Monday. Talk to you soon. Bye.